today uh, I want to tell you is a big day in the calendar, in the Christian calendar. It's Pentecost Sunday. Yeah, it is 50, you know, Pentecost, Pentecost day is in ancient Greek, it is uh, 50th day. So it is the 50th day after Easter Sunday. Exactly 50 days, all right? The 50th day after Easter Sunday. What happened on Pentecost? Pentecost was the, most people say, was the birth of the church, right? Moses went uh, on the 50th day uh, after coming out from, uh, from Egypt. He went on the 50th day to Mount Sinai and he took the law. And when he brought the law, you know, uh, down, he found the people, you know, disobedient. And, uh, and actually, 3,000 people died, you know, on that particular day. Uh, but Jesus, you know, he went uh, after the resurrection, 40 days he was on earth meeting people after his resurrection, and then he ascended into heaven on the 40th day, and on the 50th day after resurrection, at least 10 days later, the Holy Spirit came down. And when the Holy Spirit came down, uh, people got, uh, Peter went and preached the gospel, and about 3,000 people got saved. So the Spirit gives life, the law brings death. You understand? And so, uh, we celebrate the birth of the church. And um, uh, today, I want to, uh, talk one aspect. I know this is a nine-day retreat going on, and you are going to learn a lot about the Holy Spirit during these nine days. And, and, uh, uh, but there is an aspect I just thought that I have to honor the Holy Spirit today, just like we honor Christ on, on uh, Christmas and we honor Christ on His resurrection. I thought it is good for us to honor the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday. So, uh, the theme is that Scripture is Revelation 22, verse 17. It says, the Spirit and the bride say, come. And that's the whole uh, sermon about. Because now, there are relationships in the Bible. We all know that he is, Jesus is our shepherd. A shepherd guides his sheep and feeds the sheep. Jesus told Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, of course, Lord. He said, and feed my sheep. So a shepherd feeds. The shepherd guides. And then we have another relationship, and that is the relationship of father and son. And he is our father. You know, our father, all of us. You know, he's our father. And, uh, you know, what does that relationship talk about? It's about inheritance. It's about honoring our father. You know, Dirumbai Ambani had two sons. Well, what did he give his sons? He gave his sons the inheritance of his company. And so the father gives us, he says, you know, he gives us an inheritance, you know. So that's, that's the relationship. But there is a third relationship. And that relationship is about the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. And it's a relationship of love. You know, I just want to joke a little bit, but uh, it is true. You know, even it's true. You know, when nuns, uh, when they consecrate themselves to the Lord Jesus on their, on their consecration day, they actually wear a wedding dress, you know, so, okay, but we don't have to wear a wedding dress. I mean, I don't look nice on that. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you know, but it doesn't matter. It's not about gender that we talk about being the bride of Christ. It's nothing to do with gender. It's to do with relationship. And it's a relationship of deep love. You understand? Of inside love, all right? And so, today, we're going to look at four points. The Holy Spirit, the prime work is to reveal Jesus to us. That's the first point. You see, 
re revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second point is, I want to give you a, a brief picture about the bride. Right? And, and the third point is, I want to give you a picture of the bridegroom. You know, Pastor Victor talked such a lot about imagination. I thought that was splendid. And so we need to have a picture about the bridegroom. You know, I've seen some pictures. He's got blue eyes, he's got a brown beard, he looks like that. Well, that, you know, that's, that's the wrong picture I want to tell you, okay? So when you're using your imagination, you don't look at him like that. You have to see what the Bible talks about who the risen Lord is, all right? And uh, we are going to look at that. And so then, of course, the fourth point is we're going to wrap up all these things together and say, Lord, I love you. It's the love of the bride. All right? So we're going to wrap up all that. So these are the four points we're going to talk about, and uh, let us start. So the first point, the Holy Spirit prime work is to reveal Jesus to us. That's the prime work of the Lord, you see? And, and John 16, verse 15 says, The Spirit will take from what is mine, mine means Jesus, and make it known to you. Right? That's His job. That's His prime work. The Spirit will take what is mine and make it known to you. So what does He make known to He makes known the excellencies of Jesus. To start with, he makes known to us that we are sinners and that we require salvation. That's the first thing. Right? And so we give our hearts to Christ. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for us. The Holy Spirit pursues us to bring us to the place of salvation. Right? And then it moves on and you know, he, the Holy Spirit teaches us the way that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So he teaches us many things, but he also teaches us, which the real the subject of today is, is heart for us, so that we might love him, so that we might relate to him as the bride of Christ. Right? And, and that's the topic which I want to talk about, the, the relationship between the bride and the bridegroom. Right? It's so important for us. And so the Holy Spirit reveals, so therefore, uh, the Spirit and the bride say, come. It's not that the bride says, come. No, we, we can't say that because, you know, unless the Spirit moves inside our hearts, the Spirit and the bride say, come, come, right? So we're going to look at that. So that's the first point. Now, you know, John 15, verse 9, as the Father loved me, so I have loved you. That's what Jesus says. I want to tell you, uh, the Spirit of God says, you know, I want to tell you what Jesus' heart is for you. And Jesus himself says, as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. What an intense love. We're going to see this intensity of love. We're going to look at the, the intensity of God's love for you and I. Jesus' love for you and I, the bridegroom's love for the bride. The passionate bridegroom's love for the bride. We're going to look into it a little bit, but it's the Holy Spirit that is going to reveal to us during our lifetime. And so in, John, in Romans 15, verse 5, 5, verse 5, it says, And hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You know what's a pouring? It's taking a huge pouring out. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. He pours out God's love into our hearts. And only He can reveal God's love inside our hearts so that we might love God. You know, we love God because He first loved us. Right? He first loved us. I, I was a horrible sinner, hot-tempered, proud, you know, despisable guy. But God touched me, absolutely touched me. And I gave him all the glory. I know there was nothing good in me. God touched my life, and he changed me. He changed me. He, he, 
he healed me of all, you know, the knots and the muck inside my heart. And there was such a lot of knots inside. And he healed me. And he's healing each one of us. And it is the job of the Holy Spirit. So, so that's the Holy Spirit's work inside our life. The second point. Now, the picture of the bride. All right? The picture of the bride. Now, this is what God says. You see, there are many scriptures that talk about he's our father. Many. But there are also many scriptures that talks about that he is our bridegroom. Even in the Old Testament, plenty. I don't want to, you know, just keep on showing you scriptures, but I'll show you one from the Old Testament. Hosea 2.16. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. Ha. Ah. You will no longer call me my master. In that day, which day? When the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit comes. You will not call me my master anymore. You will call me my husband. So that's, that's there in the Old Testament. And it's actually many places in the Old Testament. And I don't want to get into that. But now, I'm gi giving you the picture of the bride. So Revelations 19, verse 7 to 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. You see, he's coming, he's coming. He's coming for whom? For his bride. He's coming for his bride. Eh? And there is passion inside him. His passion. He's coming for his bride. A bride whom he has laid down his life for. He's coming, but the bride has to be made ready to rule with the bridegroom jointly, but has to be made ready. All right. And fine linen and bright and clean was given her to wear. See, see that's the picture. The bride has to remain, has to become ready. Right? Has to make herself ready. All right. Now, another, another verse. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 to 28. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church. Same way. Wow. Christ loved the church. It's a bridegroom's love. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Bride. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish. Stain you can see from far. Wrinkle you've got to get closer, but blemish you've got to get very close to see a blemish. And I can tell you, He's coming for such a bride that can be examined from afar and is perfect from close and is perfect and from very close and still perfect. And such is the picture of the bride that the Lord is waiting for. And he's coming. He's coming. He's coming for such a bride and with passion. Right? Okay. And, and of course, she is holy and blameless. Right? So, that's the picture of the bride. I want to give you the picture of the bridegroom. And let's see the picture of the bridegroom. You know, Jesus, if you look into the Gospels, he had a, he had a very, he used the title most often, and that was Son of Man. If you look into the Gospels, that's his favorite title, the Son of Man. Right? That's his favorite. So, why? Why does he use this title? This title is referring to what Daniel saw in a vision many years ago. And that is given in Daniel chapter uh, 7. 
And I'm going to read some few verses from Daniel chapter 7. And the first one is, as I looked, thrones were set in place. Now, this is a vision, all right? And Daniel lived many years before Christ. Right? And so, uh, he says, uh, Daniel said, as I looked, thrones were set in place. And the ancient of days took a seat. His clothing was white as snow. The hair on his head was white like wool. That's the vision he saw. Ancient of days, I believe, is referring to the Father. The Father God. Right? So, he saw that vision. And that was the, the vision. And his hair was, of his head was white like wool. Then he saw another vision in the same chapter. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. Sorry, there is something left. Okay, and he was led the son of man. And in Revelations chapter 1, 13 to 14, Revelations chapter 1, 13 to 14, and when I turned, John, this is John, uh, the apostle, and when I turned, I saw someone like a son of man, dressed in robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest, his head and hair were white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Now, that's, that's a picture of the bridegroom. His head was white as snow. I mean, why white as snow? Why, why? Because it is the same head which Daniel saw on the Father. See, the glory of the Father is the glory of the Son. It's the same glory. This is showing that he is divine. Jesus is divine, right? right? But his eyes were blazing like fire. And I look at those eyes. They were not blue. They were not brown. They were not Asian. They were not European. They were blazing like fire. And I, you know, want to use my imagination. I want to look at this bridegroom. And I want to ask myself, what this fire is all about. Of course, God is like a consuming fire. He's like a consuming fire. But when he looks at his, and of course, when he looks at sin, he's like a consuming fire. There's no doubt about it. But when he looks at his bride, I can't imagine, I cannot agree that that fire is anything but the fire of love. I can't, because he's looking at his bride. And so, it is a fire of love, the passion of love. You see, God, Jesus says, I love you the same way the Father loves me. And from eternity to eternity, the Father loved the Son. Don't tell me it was lukewarm love. It was passionate love. And that same love is looking at you and I. That same love. And he says, remain in my love. Remain, meditate on my love, contemplate on my love, imagine my love for you. Use your imagination and you'll see that love coming inside by the Holy Spirit. Because we are so self-centered and we bring down ourselves so much, so much. We, bring, we have such a low opinion and so we think when God is looking at us, He's looking at us. Uh, uh, uh. That's not the way he looks at us. He looks at us with fire of love. But I want to say to you, that same love will burn up everything in you and I which is not of love. You understand? Everything that is not of love inside you and I, he's going to burn it up. You get the point? You get the point? And so when you look at him, anything that is not of love inside you, I want to say, 
the Holy Spirit is going to burn it. He's going to burn that up. He says, the Lord Jesus says, I mean, John the Baptist says, he who comes after me will baptize you with what? Fire. Fire to burn up everything that is not of love. You must understand when the, the bridegroom looks at the bride, he looks with passionate love, not judgment. Not judgment, my dear. He doesn't look at us and shake his head. Ah. No, he looks at passion. He gave himself for you and for me. He loves us passionately. Be touched by that fire of love inside your heart. You will see that your heart gets warmed up in his love. Your heart gets warmed up in his love. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. Remain in my love. Mm. So, that's the picture of the bridegroom. That's all I want to talk about. The picture of the bridegroom that I'm going to ask you to imagine for the rest of your life. Use your imagination. You use your contemplation. Use the pictures. Say, God, if you look at Jesus, he's glorious. His hair is white. Absolutely. That's the Father's glory upon him. He's glorious. He's excellent. He's magnificent. But he has love for me. And passionate love for me. Oh, for you and for me. For all of us. We are his collectively his bride. Right? Yeah. All right. So, the love, how do we respond to that? The more you contemplate on his love for you, the more your heart will be warmed up. You will be warmed up with love for him. All right? All right. So, Matthew, I want to talk about this thing more. All right. Matthew, the, the fourth point, and which is the last point, and, and we'll close. I, I promised my wife I'm going to preach for half an hour. I want to keep that wrong. <laughs> sure. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 3. Fourth point, all right? Now, this is really the last public address of Jesus before he went to the cross. This is virtually the last public address. And you know what the address was? Is about the bride and the bridegroom. Uh, and I think of his heart. I think of his heart. He's wanting a bride. And, and this is what he says. Jesus spoke to them again in a parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come. But they refused to come. And of course, it goes on. Who's the king? The father. Who's the son? Jesus. And what is he looking for? A wedding. He's looking for a wedding. He's looking for a bride. He's just looking for a bride. And so many young men are there. They're looking for brides. Right? Jesus is looking for a bride. And that's, that's the last public address. And, and, and in that, uh, Matthew ch chapter 22 there was one uh, teacher of the law, and he asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And in the same chapter, Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so, uh, you know, this, this thing is love your God with all your heart with all, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's always like this. You know, you can't separate this two. You know, love your God, love your neighbor. Right? And even in, in Psalm 16 verse 2, I don't know whether it's up there, 
but Psalm 16, verse 2. I can read it out to you. He says, uh, verse 2 and 3, I said to the Lord, that's what David said, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. No good thing. And as for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. So love your God, love your neighbor. You know, that's, that's, that's right in Scripture, right? Right in Scripture. Love your God, love your neighbor, right? So that's right in Scripture. So, so uh, but that's, Jesus says, that's the first and the greatest commandment. And I want to talk about that part. Because it's the passionate love the bride should have for the bridegroom. And that's, I want to talk about that. Love your God with all your heart. We know that this is the greatest commandment. But I wonder how much time we meditate on this particular commandment. I wonder. You can check out to yourself. Oh, that's the greatest commandment. Yeah, yeah. Put it aside. No, no, no. Don't put it aside. That's the greatest. It's the greatest. It's the passionate love that the bride should have for the bridegroom. Love your God with what? All, and I think about myself, is it all or is it 50-50? All my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength. That's the greatest commandment. Where does it come from? Actually, it came from the Shema in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. You're O Israel. The Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You know, that is given in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel. I mean, this was Moses talking about just when he came down and after the people were, you know, redeemed. And he says, Hear, O Israel, I want to tell you, the Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then, 30 years later, just before he was dying, he said something else in Deuteronomy 30 verse 6. Please show that. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6. The first was a commandment, but the second was a promise. And the promise says, the Lord your God will circumcise. It's a promise. I will get a bride for my son. It's a promise. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that, so that you might love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. That's a promise. God says, look, I am getting a bride for my son. And that bride, will, his hearts are going to be circumcised, and that bride is going to love my son with all his heart, with all his soul, with all, his, all her strength. That's a promise. And God will get that bride for his son by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will circumcise our hearts, and he will get his bride. Do you think God will not be able to get his bride? Of course he will get his bride. He will get it. That's a promise. That's there. So, let us study now. Briefly, what does this greatest commandment mean? Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart. With all your heart. Let us start with that. With all your heart. Psalm 27, verse 4. For one thing, however, have I asked. David said, one thing, just one thing. One thing have I asked, and that will I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his holy temple. There's one thing, not many things, one thing. For years, I wanted one thing to get into my wedding suit. That was my goal, <laughs> to get into my wedding suit. 
I was slim, I bloated, and I can't get into my wedding suit. <laughs> but we have many one things in our lives. I don't know. All of us have one things. Mine was like getting into the wedding suit. But it's a joke. But many of us have one things. What is our deepest desire? And David says, to love my God. That's one thing. Right? In Luke chapter 10, verses 41 to 42, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that. One thing is needed. Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's the greatest commandment. Eh? Psalm 91 verse 14. This is from the NKJV version. Because he has set his love upon me. There is a setting for that one thing. I've set. Because once you set, then you will follow. Yeah, what is set inside? I make a decision. When I wanted to get into my wedding suit, I tell you, I set myself to do exercise. Yeah. Telling you the truth. I set, you got to set yourself to love God inside your heart because then your feet will follow. Your mind will follow. Your soul, your desires will follow. You got to set yourself. And David said, because, uh, uh, I mean, the psalmist said, uh, God said about the psalmist, because he has set his love upon me. And, and, and you have to do the same thing, brothers. All of us have to do the same. We are the bride of Christ. Now, some people, they don't set. They, they serve the Lord a lot. And they serve him so well. And Jesus commended these people. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. So, yeah, it says, now look at these people, all right? I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men, and you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and I found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. What a commendation. And then he says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Yet I have, fors I have got this against you. You see, he commends people for their hard work and for their service. He commends, but he says, look, your heart is not so engaged with me, and I want that. I want that. I want that. That's important for me. So, so there are some people like that, and there are some people who are 50-50, and that is also given. They want to see how much they can get away with. I mean, they love the Lord, but they want to, yeah, 50-50. You know that biscuit, 50-50. <clears throat> yeah, so that's given in Revelations. Revelations chapter 3, verse 15 to 16. And says here, um, yeah, where is it gone? Mm. Revelations 3, uh, sorry, I can't see properly, really. Ah, verse 15. I wish you were either hot or cold. Either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. 50-50, guys. How much they can get away with? There's no passion for the Lord. Yeah, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. But their minds are occupied somewhere else. Their desires are occupied somewhere else. There is no one thing passion in their lives. 
And he says, you know, I'll spit you out. That's God's word. So, brings me to the love your God with all your heart. Then love your God with all your mind. I really don't want to enlarge on that because Pastor Rick did, did such a wonderful job about the mind, about our imaginations. All I want to ask you is, what traffic is going through your mind? That's all I want to tell you. Because whatever traffic is going through your mind will determine, really, where your heart is. All right? And you can check that out yourself. What traffic is going? Huh? Well, coming close. Love God with all your strength. With all your strength. You see, if your heart is set to love God, then you will love God with all your strength. We serve others, not because we want some expectations, but because we want to love God. You understand? That's the reason why we serve. We serve people without expectations. The moment you have expectations from others, you'll be disappointed to begin off with. And I question my own heart if I have expectations. But I am here, you know, in Hindi we say, don't make nakra if you are a naukar. You understand? <laughs> that means, I don't know, you understand what I mean, right? Nakra means, you know, tamasha, all that. You have come to serve. You're a naukar. You're a servant, right? Why make this nakra? So, so, love God with all your strength. God, I am serving because I love you. Understand? That's the motivation for me. Right? Uh, in giving, in praying for others, it's be and in speaking. In speaking. I will speak words of life because I love God. Because I love God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 to 30, the only reason I am determined to follow this is because I love Jesus. Right? Because otherwise, my carnal desires will always be there to criticize, to do this, to do that. But because of Jesus, I said, God, I'm not going to do that. You see, my heart is set to love God. Right? And so Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 uh, and 30. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out from your mouth. And you know, that requires a lot of strength. Because our tongue is ready to criticize, ready to do this. Right? Now, and he says, but only what is helpful to build others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. Uh, that's my motivation. Because I love God, I'm going to build others up with my, with my tongue. I'm going to bless others with my tongue because I love him. Love God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul. Soul, soul. Last point. Then we close. Soul, soul. Soul is your identity. You know, we have got identity. And we, we take pride in our identity. You know, who are you? Uh, I mean, what's the background? Oh, I, wa I, I was a very, very famous naval architect, which is a fact, really. It's a fact. I'm not joking. Yeah, I am a famous naval architect. Yeah. So that's my identity. Well, my identity is misplaced if it is on something external. What's your son doing? Oh, my son. Oh, he's a director. Wow. What's your son doing? Your son. My, my, my son. He's, he's, he's doing well. My identity is now in my son. My identity is in the externals. 
He said, love your God with all your soul. What? Love your God with my real identity. I want to tell you, I am a successful man at the end of my life if I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. And you know there's a song. Actually, it is from Song of Solomon's. I am my beloved, and he is mine, and his banner over me is love. That's my identity. I am my beloved. And he is mine, and his banner over me is love. Finally, the spirit and the bride say, come. You know, this particular verse is virtually at the end of the Bible. The spirit and the bride say, come. It is the come to those who are not believers. In that context... He says, the spirit and the bride say, come and be saved. Come into ye who's thirsty, come. Let him drink. That's the, that's the verse, if you look into that. Come who is thirsty. The spirit and the bride say, come. That the bride is the church. And it is also in the context. The spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. Come for the wedding of the Lamb. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening to this message. To know more about us, please visit www.adonai-ministries.com.